All right, everyone. Well, hello. Welcome to the Mid Speeds Live class. Let's go ahead and get started. These are going to be um, the most picturable words from the basic English word list. All right, here we go. Ready? Angle, bridge, dress, horse, ant, brush, drop, hospital, apple, bucket, ear, house, arch, bulb, egg, island, arm, button, engine, jewel, army, cake, eye, kettle, baby, camera, face, key, bag, card, farm, knee, ball, carriage, feather, knife, band, cart, finger, not, basin, cat, fish, leaf, basket, chain, flag, leg, bath, cheese, floor, library, bed, chest, fly, line, bee, chin, foot, lip, bell, church, fork, lock, berry, circle, fowl, map, bird, clock, frame, match, blade, cloud, garden, monkey, board, coat, girl, moon, boat, collar, glove, mouth, bone, comb, goat, muscle, book, cord, gun, nail, boot, cow, hair, neck, bottle, cup, hammer, needle, box, curtain, hand, nerve, boy, cushion, hat, net, brain, dog, head, nose, break, door, heart, nut, branch, drain, hook, office, brick, drawer, horn, orange. All right, now here are, here is uh, the results from a survey of the best places to eat breakfast. Number one, in bed. Number two, IHOP. Number three, Denny's. Number four, sitting on the couch, bowl of cereal on my lap, watching Sports Center. Number five, Cracker Barrel. Number six, Grandma's House. Number seven, McDonald's. Number eight, Waffle House. Number nine, Bob Evans. Number 10, Papa John's Cafe. For the Papa John's Pizza, but not Papa John's Cafe. All right. Now I've got some locations with their zip codes. Here we go. Washington, D.C. 20001. Honolulu, Hawaii 96811. Indianapolis, Indiana 46249. Frankfort, Kentucky 40601. Boston, Massachusetts, 02154. Jackson, Mississippi, 39223. Montgomery, Alabama, 36134. Juneau, Alaska, 99801. Denver, Colorado, 80213. Lincoln, Nebraska, 68502. Concord, New Hampshire, 03301. Raleigh, North Carolina, 26, or excuse me, 27633. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73141. Providence, Rhode Island, 02903. Austin, Texas, 78722. Olympia, Washington, 
98501. All right. Now, moving into some tingle tamers. Oops, here we go. Peripherally evident, inadequately explained, quietly persuaded, alternately pressing, accessories available, radiology department, foreign exchange student, physical therapist, constantly misread, discriminating consumers, extensive amenities, professional community, suburban campground, hand painted pictures, international symbolism, microwave combinations, recently distributed, threatened species. All right. Now, I've got some words that start with co. Here we go. Cohabitation, coexistence, coexist, coefficient, coeducation, coed co-defendant, co-counsel, co-chairman, co-chairperson, co-author, co-architect, cooperate, cooperation, coordinate, coordination, co-partner, co-pilot, co-president, co-respondent, co-sign, co-signer, Covariant, coworker. Now these words start with DE. Deactivate, defray, debar, defrost, debase, defrosts, debrief, degrade, debug, dehumidify, debugged, dehydrate, decapitate, decipher. Demoralize, declaim, deplane, decode, decoder, deployment, deportation, decompose, decomposition, decontrol, depreciate, depress, derail, deregulate, deface, defame, deregulation, Desegregate, desegregation, destructive, dethrone, detour, detoxification, detoxify, defile, deflect, deflection, defoliate, deform, defraud. All right. Now, common phrases, here we go. Who feel, who feels, would feel, you feel, had felt, has felt, have felt, he felt, I felt, if he felt, if I felt, if you felt, it felt, so he felt, so I felt, so you felt, that he felt, that I felt, that you felt, they felt, we felt, what he felt, what I felt, what you felt, when he felt, when I felt, where he felt, where I felt, where you felt, where, whether he felt, whether I felt, whether or not he felt, whether or not I felt, whether or not you felt, whether you felt, which he felt, which I felt, which you felt, who felt, for instance, for the, 
for the record, Mr. Foreman, Mr. Four Person, Ms. Four Person, from the, from time to time, gentlemen of the jury. All right. Now I've got some email addresses for you. Just a little reminder, www dot is what, W-A-U-T, dot com is D-A-U-M, dom, dot net, D-W-E-T, duet, dot gov, D-W-O-F, dot org, D-W-O-R-G, um, at is A-T with the flag, forward slash is F-A-S-H, and dot, if dot's in the middle, you just write D-O-T with the flag. All right, here we go www.google.com, www.freelancekillers.com, www.online.wellsfargo.com, www.ncra.org, www.craigslist.org, www.edd dot ca dot gov forward slash unemployment www dot shop at sbc global dot net www dot sheila evans at gmail dot com then these are just going to be um you know uh different uh email addresses okay Frank Hartford at yahoo.com, Raymond Thomas at hotmail.com, Stephen Gonzalez at msn.com, Martin McCaffin at aol.com, Cynthia Waters at gmail.com, Deborah Lemon at charter.net, Cynthia Adams at yahoo.com, Mariah Bell at aol.com, Michael Myers at hotmail.com, Tina Lay at yahoo.com. All right. How are we doing on time? Good, we're doing good. Now I'm going to give you some medical words. Here we go. Hydrochloride, patient, codeine, treatment, intractable, splatter, remission, IV, Reproductive, diaphragm, obstetrician, fracture, prenatal, immovable, prognosis, sigmoid, thermometer, phlebotomy, osteoarthritis, hypochondriac, Myocardium, subcutaneous, dermatitis, encephalitis, epicondyl, schizophrenia, ophthalmology, hypoglossal, headache, gingivitis, and pectoral. All right. Now, I have some sentences using briefs. I'm going to read you the brief first and then give you the sentence. These are basic briefs, so you should know these. If there's something that we come across that maybe I think you might not give, you might not have, I'll give it to you, okay? All right. 
so we have more than and then mourn. Newspaper, honor about, O-E-R-B. Other than, pressure, that's either P-R-E-S-H or P-R final R-B. Uh, promise, prosecute, prosecution, prosecutor, telephone, treatment, will you please, L-U-P, would you please, W-O-U-P, yes or no, Y-E-R-N, are you able, associate, association, black and blue, brother-in-law, I write that as B-R-O-N-L, burden of proof, daughter-in-law, D-A-U-R-N-L, defendant's exhibit, D-E-X, diagram, DRAM, do you recognize, employ, employee, employer, employment, enable, N long A-B-L, enable, father-in-law, F-A-U-R-N-L, I didn't believe, I didn't do, Y-I-D, I didn't feel, I didn't go, I didn't get, I didn't know, I didn't mean, I didn't say, I didn't see, I didn't understand, in and out, N-O-U-T, Nout. here are your sentences. All his friends came to mourn him. I need more than that. So more than is long O, M, long O, R, N. This is M, mourn is M, O, U, R, N. The newspaper was wet. The incident was on or about the fifth. Other than that, I don't know. To relieve pressure, you must calm down. I promise I won't go. We are going to prosecute. They all came to witness the prosecution. He loved his job as prosecutor. I need to make a telephone call. This is inhumane treatment. Will you please shut up? Would you please go away? Do you like him, yes or no? Are you able to walk? Jack is my associate. We work in association with Mac. I saw black and blue marks. Mike is her brother-in-law. We need the burden of proof. I have one daughter-in-law. May I enter defendant's exhibit five? The diagram shows he hit her. Do you recognize anyone in here? I will employ that idea. I was an employee of that firm. I did not like my employer. Joe was seeking employment there. This will enable you to talk and walk. My father-in-law is George. I didn't believe him either. I didn't do the dishes. I didn't feel it was true. I didn't get any gifts. I didn't go because I was tired. I didn't know you worked there. I didn't mean to offend you. I didn't say that. I didn't see that dog. I didn't understand the question. This is the in and out of the case. All right. Now let's move on to literary. This is called SoCal Holiday. Let me just date this so I know that we read it. Here we go. I'm going to start this at 120, but I will work my way to 140, okay? Here we go. Remember when you learned 
to ride a bike. Distances melted away under your tires as you and your friends master the pavement with two-wheeled pedal power unlocking the mysteries of your neighborhood. At a few years of age, some mechanical sophistication and a piggy bank full of allowance money, and you might have given in to motor scooter madness. Case in point is this young woman aboard a Salisbury motor glide scooter in this 1936 view in the vicinity of Exposition Park in Los Angeles. Scooters are distinguished from their motorcycle cousins by having a rear mounted engine and step through frame and floorboard where the rider places his or her feet together rather than straddling the machine. Introduced by inventor E. Foster Salisbury in 1936, the motor glide was built in California and along with other scooter brands, quickly caught on with the American public before the war disrupted production. Salisbury scooters launched the continuously variable automatic transmission, which would be widely adopted in the scooter industry. Later, scooters made by Salisbury and its American rival, Cushman, sported streamlined deco body panels that influenced the now famous post-war Italian scooter designs. Product placement in film has fed scooter mania over the years with notable star turns in the 1953 movie Roman Holiday and its famous Vespa scooter scene with Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck and Quadro Fenia, the 1979 British film of 1960s teen angst or oxed between scooter rivals, the mods and the rockers who rode Lambrettas and Vespas respectively. More recently, French animal control agent, Captain Chantal Dubois exhibited magnificent scooter skills in Madagascar 3, Europe's most wanted. Keen-eyed readers may spot a photographer's expediency, the deployed kickstand to steady the subject for the camera. All right. Now I've got some jury charge for you. This is going to be a deposition admonition. So it's basically the admonition that attorneys give a witness in a deposition. Here we go. Hello, good morning. My name is Joy Kikorian, and I'm one of the attorneys that represents Mid-Century Insurance and Hair Headquarters with respect to your workers' compensation claim. We are here to take your deposition regarding that claim. You have had an opportunity to speak with your attorney regarding this deposition process and what you can expect, but I'm going to go over some of the basic ground rules right now. It's probably something that you just heard from your attorney, but I need to make certain that you and I have the same understanding as to what's going to happen here today. 
So if I am repeating something, I apologize. The very first thing is a deposition, is a oral proceeding. Everything that is happening here today is being taken down by the court reporter. And therefore, it's important that you respond to my questions using words like yes or no, or whatever you need to answer. The reason why I state that is that a lot of times people will say, uh-huh, uh-uh, or they will shake their head. They'll shrug their shoulders or they will point. And I may know what you mean by that today, but it will not transcribe well onto the record. So I need you to respond verbally. If you do happen to do one of those things, either I or your attorney will ask you to clarify. And that's only because we are trying to get a clear record. The next thing is, you were just given an oath by the court reporter. That's the same oath that you would take as though we were in a court of law. You're sworn to tell the truth under the penalty of perjury. You've just sworn to tell the truth. And if you don't tell us the truth today, that means that you may be found guilty of committing the crime of perjury, which is telling a lie while under oath to tell the truth. Essentially, what you need to do today is just tell us the truth. And that oath that you were just given would be the same oath that you would be given if you were sitting in a courtroom with a judge. Even though we are in the informal surroundings of my conference room, the oath has the same force and effect as though we were in a courtroom. At the end of the deposition proceeding, the court reporter will prepare what is known as a deposition transcript. It will be an eight and a half by 11 sized booklet, and it will read question, answer, question, answer. You will have an opportunity to review your responses and make any changes which you feel are necessary or important. I do want to caution you though, that any changes which you make, which are substantive in value, and by that I mean changing a yes to a no, or no to a yes on something, that can be considered important. Those types of changes can be, can be commented on either by myself or any other attorney at a subsequent proceeding or hearing. And I bring this to your attention because my ability to comment on those types of changes could prove to be embarrassing to you and could, in fact, impact on your credibility later on. My whole purpose for bringing this up to you is just to remind you to give us your best deposition testimony here today. I'm going to be asking you questions today which will ask you to recall times, places, dates, and people. I don't expect that you have total or perfect recollection because no one does, but I am entitled 
to your best responses or whatever information you do have. And an example of that might be, if I asked you when something occurred and you don't recall the exact date on which the event actually occurred, but you do recall that it occurred in 2008 as an example, that is a perfectly acceptable answer. If you start to respond to one of my questions, I'm going to assume two things. I'm going to assume, number one, that you've heard my question, and number two, that you've understood it. So if either of those two things are not true, then I need you to tell me. I would be more than happy to restate or rephrase my question as many times as is necessary for you to understand what I'm asking. I don't want you to think to yourself, well, I'm not quite certain, so let me try and give it my best shot. If there is any question in your mind as to what I'm asking, please tell me and I will be happy to rephrase the question. All right. Now, let's move into Q&A. Before we actually get into a transcript, I want to give you a Q&A drill. This is going to be quick question and answer back and forth, and it's all over the board, so it doesn't really follow a pattern. Okay, so that's the uh, challenging part about it. Okay, let me see here. Okay, there we go. It seems to me that most restaurants are too expensive. I don't think so. Where can you have your hair cut? At a hairdresser's. What will you do this afternoon? I'll play soccer. Where's Mike? At school. Have you studied English before? Yes, but I need to practice in speaking. How long did you study last night? For three hours. When was the last time you took a picture? About four days ago. Don't you have the right change? No, I only have two nickels. When do you write to your friends? I do it whenever I have time. Did she leave a message? Yes, she said she'd call later. How many times have you gone camping? Three times. Can I see your ticket, please? I'm afraid I can't find it. How much do you weigh? I weigh 800 pounds. May I borrow your car next Thursday? My friend is coming to visit me and I'd like to show her around. Sure, anytime. All right, now I'm gonna do that one more time at 160. All right, I just had to date it. Here we go. That was at 140. Here we go. It seems to me that most restaurants are too expensive. I don't think so. Where can you have your hair cut? At a hairdresser's? What will you do this afternoon? I'll play soccer. Where's Mike? At school. Have you studied English before? Yes, but I need practice in speaking. How long did you study last night? For three hours. When was the last time you took a picture? About four days ago. Don't you have the right change? No, I only have two nickels. When do you write to your friends? 
I do it whenever I have time. Did she leave a message? Yes, she said she'd call later. How many times have you gone camping? Three times. Can I see your ticket, please? I'm afraid I can't find it. How much do you weigh? I weigh a hundred pounds. May I borrow your car next Thursday? My friend is coming to visit me and I'd like to show her around. Sure, any time. All right. Well, let's move into a regular transcript. We're going to start at 120 and I will work my way to 160. Okay, and let's see here. Looks like plaintiff is questioning. Did Mr. Gates tell you how many times Trigger fired the gun at him? I don't recall if he said specifically how many rounds. I don't recall if he said he knew how many rounds that Trigger had fired at him. Do you recall Mr. Gates telling you that he was shot five to six times? I'm sorry. Do you recall Mr. Gates telling you that he was shot at five to six times? I don't recall him saying that. However, if I put it in my report, if I can look at that to refresh my recollection, would it refresh your recollection if you looked at that portion of your report? Yes, it would. With the court's permission? Sure. What page was that on? That would be page number one of the supplemental. I don't seem to have that supplemental in this folder. What was the date of that supplemental at the bottom? I have an idea. Why don't you just show him what you're referring to? That's fine, that would work. Okay, did you take a look at your report? Yes, I did. Is your recollection now refreshed? Yes, it is. Did Mr. Gates tell you how many times Trigger shot at him? He said, Gates said five to six times. During the course of your investigation, did you also have the opportunity to make contact with Kyle Smith? Yes, I did. Do you see Kyle Smith here in court today? Yes, I do. Could you please identify him for the record? He's seated next to his defense attorney in an orange Santa Barbara County jumpsuit. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant, Kyle Smith. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right, thank you. The record will so reflect. Where was it that you initially made contact with Kyle Smith? In Portland, Oregon. Why is it that you made contact with Mr. Smith there? Mr. Smith had been arrested in Portland and was inside of a, had been booked in a local jail in that area. We were given the extradition paperwork to go pick him up. And was that the date of that contact with Mr. Smith, October 14th of 2014? I'm sorry, did you say October 14th? Yes. No, I believe that it was, is it in November? November 14th. Would it refresh your recollection if you looked at your report? It was October 15th. October 14th, I believe, that we flew out there. It was on the 15th on Friday. We contacted him on the second day. So sometime in October, you made contact with Mr. Smith out of state. Is that correct? 
Yes, I believe that the 14th was a Thursday. The 15th was a Friday, if I recall correctly. It was the second day. We arrived on a Thursday and we picked him up on a Friday afternoon. Okay, at some point after your contact with Mr. Smith, did you interview him? Yes, I did. Prior to interviewing him, did you advise him of his Miranda rights? Yes, I did. And how did you do that? Well, initially we had caught a plane flight from Oregon, the first leg of it to Portland, Oregon. Let me stop you one second. In advising the defendant of his Miranda rights, did you read it off of your department issued Miranda card? At the time, no, I didn't. Okay, did you advise him of his rights based on your memory of what your department issued Miranda card says? Yes, we realized that we were in Portland, Oregon, and I had wanted to talk to Mr. Smith, and I was looking out for his best interests. And I read him his rights, and then told him that I didn't want to speak to him at this moment, because we were inside the airport, and there were lots of people around us, and I didn't want him talking, about guns and shooting people inside an airport. You just stated that you read the defendant his rights? I told him his rights. Okay, and what did you tell the defendant with regard to his rights? Well, that he had the right to remain silent and that anything he said could be used against him in a court of law. Okay. Thank you. Now, what did Mr. Smith tell you when you asked him if he understood his rights? He said yes, he understood, and he wanted to speak to me. Okay, then what happened? Well, we got on a plane, the final flight from Portland to Los Angeles, and Mr. Smith asked me if I had that piece of paper so that he could write down what happened. So I gave him a pen and paper, and he spent quite some time writing it down. So he provided you with a written statement? Yes, he did, a written statement. After we were done booking him later that night, he finished his statement. How long was the document that Mr. Smith wrote? I believe it was approximately 15 pages. So prior to speaking with Mr. Smith at Santa Barbara Detention Center, you re-advised him of his Miranda rights? Yes, I did. Okay, now what did Mr. Smith tell you happened on September 14 at Harold Park? What did he tell me? Well, Mr. Smith told me that there was an ongoing argument with himself and he referred to Mr. Gates as Bug and that Bug has confronted him numerous times. I wanted to call him Mr. Gates's son and Smith having a problem with him and, okay, just a moment. I think you lost us. Yes, did Mr. Smith tell you that Mr. Smith was having a problem with the son of Anthony Gates? No, Mr. Smith told me that Anthony Gates had confronted him about an alleged problem that was going on between his son and, excuse me, Smith and Gates's son. So, okay, what else did Mr. Smith tell you? He said that Mr. Gates had pulled out what he believed was a screwdriver or a knife, and he had swung the knife at him. Who is he? Mr. Gates. Okay, continue. All right, now, can I say one thing? 
Smith said that Gates had swung the screwdriver at Lawson, and there were words exchanged between the two of them. Smith told me that he believed that Gates was going to go home and get a gun. So Smith ran upstairs to his apartment with Lawson, and he retrieved his handgun, where he loaded the handgun. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to object to the word he, so we can clarify. I'm getting lost again. Detective, you were doing a good job, but then you started using the word he again. You have too many people in this case, too many players involved here for us to know who he is. Okay, I'm sorry. I mean, I kind of follow you, but it is confusing. Absolutely, Your Honor. Thank you. So what did Mr. Smith tell you happened after he started running hard through the park? Well, he said that he was running hard into the park to catch up to Mr. Gates. And then he told him that he couldn't let him do this. Okay, now let me ask you, did Mr. Smith tell you what he did when he turned around and ran? Mr. Smith told me that he had continued firing and then he stopped and he fled from the park. Did Mr. Smith tell you why it was that he shot at Mr. Gates? Mr. Smith told me that he believed that Mr. Gates was going to return to his house. Mr. Gates was going to return to Mr. Gates's house and retrieve a firearm. Did Mr. Smith tell you that he shot Mr. Gates because he didn't want to be a snitch and wanted to handle it on the streets? Yes, objection leading. For the purpose of the preliminary hearing, I don't have a problem, overruled. Did Mr. Smith make any statements to you about earning respect for Mr. Gates? I had Mr. Smith, I asked him why he did not call the police when he returned to his apartment prior to chasing Gates down, and he told me that he didn't want to be known as a snitch. So he didn't get, he doesn't want them to not respect him. And if he calls the cops, that is what will happen. He needed to handle his business on the street himself. Okay, well, with regard to Mr. Lawson, did you ask Mr. Smith if Mr. Lawson goes by a moniker? Yes, I did. What did he tell you? He told me that he knows him as Shasta, but everybody calls him, Smith knows him as Eli and Shasta, but everybody calls him ES. Who are we talking about now? Who are we talking about? She's asking about Mr. Lawson. Who is Lawson? Shasta. Why do I care about Lawson? He's pled out. Who cares? He has, okay. When you made contact with Mr. Gates, did Mr. Gates refer to Mr. Lawson as Shasta? Mr. Gates? Yes. Mr. Gates refers to Lawson as Shasta. Yes. Nothing further. Cross-examination? Thank you, Your Honor. The gunshots that Mr. Gates received to his body when you saw Mr. Gates, where were the gunshots on Mr. Gates' body? The gunshots that I could see, he had one, Mr. Gates had one, I believe it was, on his upper right arm. It looked like a through and through shot, and then one would be in his upper torso. It could have been a through and through shot that went, you know, through his arm and into his chest. When you say upper torso, you're pointing near your armpit. 
under my armpit rib cage area, the right side, on the victim's right side. Okay, thank you. And he was bleeding from his back, but they didn't roll him so that we could, you know, so that we could see that any of those wounds. Okay, so then am I correct in assuming that Mr. Gates was laying on his stomach when you saw Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates was lying on his back. He was lying on his back? What do you mean they rolled him? I said that they could not roll him or they did not roll him to allow us to see if there were any wounds on his backside, okay? They were trying to maintain C-spine. Did you see any wounds to his stomach? By him, I mean Mr. Gates. I don't recall any wounds, any fresh wounds to his stomach. I was busy trying to take pictures of the scene. What about wounds to the chest on Mr. Gates? I don't recall any other, other than on his right side, upper torso. You said that there was an ongoing problem between Mr. Smith and Mr. Gates. What kind of a problem? Well, I think that you said that the problem was with the son, Mr. Gates' son, right? Well, I have two sides to the story. I have Mr. Gates saying that Kyle Smith has been mean, mugging his, these were the words that Mr. Smith used. What does that mean? I guess mad dogging, staring him down, and Mr. Smith denies that there has ever been any issues between himself and the victim's son. All right, so let's do our read back. All right, this read back is going to start with de defense, okay? We do have the court and plaintiff that comes in as well, okay? And I'm going to read this first set at 160. Here we go. Ready? Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from the hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence. Sustained. All right, so let's do that again at 140. Just going to mark my spot. All right. And let's go ahead and Start right back where we, where we started, and this will be at 140. Ready? Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. 
later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from the hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence. Sustained. All right, so I did accidentally use plaintiff with one of the questions. So, um, you know, just make a note of that. If you um, go back and read back the selection from the 140, then you know that, um, you know, the plaintiff comes in. Um, with one of the uh, questions where the previous take, um, it was defense except for the ob objection. Okay, so just make a note of that. All right, let's do this again at 120. Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from the hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence sustained. All right, so whatever take you decide to read back, just go back and uh, listen to, to that tape and compare it to your notes. So this last take was exactly like the first one, okay? All right, uh, let's see here, All right at six o'clock. So that concludes our Mid Speeds Live class. Have a wonderful day and I hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.